Do you know me? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, I normally teach uh, the world politics in GSIS, but this semester I'm not teaching. So most of you are first semester students, right? The first semester you take, are supposed to take this class. Okay, I'm a, I'm a professor here at Korea University in the Graduate School of International Studies. And uh, I'm also the president of Human Asia, that is a human rights NGO uh, dealing with uh, human rights problems in Asia. And I also, uh, as you see, can see there, the member of the UN Human Rights Council Advisory Committee. So uh, today, I'd like to uh, discuss uh, the importance of human rights in the development plan. Um, and in order to understand why human rights are so important uh, in the field of development, we need to understand the changing the international structure of political system. So I will start from uh, let's see. Uh, I will discuss first the uh, new global environment. Uh, what is the fundamental changes uh, happening in the 21st century? Then I will briefly uh, mention the concept of global governance. And thirdly, I will discuss human rights systems particularly UN system, uh, and discussion of the human rights and development, the main focus of the lecture today, the relationship between human rights and development, and I will conclude. The three points I'd like to make, uh, basically. The first is uh, there is, a, uh, in my opinion, there is a fundamental changes of international global uh, structure. We need to understand what kind of change is occurring. And second point is that the human rights uh, is the mainstream, uh, mainstreaming of human rights in global society. In relation to the changing structure of international system, the more people argue that human rights need to be more fundamental in discussing security and development. Okay, and we need to understand that. And thirdly, uh, why human rights in development? Okay. Is it uh, conflicting or complementing? Okay, how we can understand okay, the, the concept of human rights in, in discussion of hum, uh, development? That's the point I'd like to make. Um, I think I have uh, 45 minutes. Okay. First, let's look at the, sorry. Um, I just divided uh, two important century in long history of human beings, 17th century and 21st century. And we can say uh, before 17th century, it's a pre-modern feudal system and between 17th and 21st century, probably we still live in the modern era the, where the nation states are central actors. And I believe most of you are taking the world politics class. And you know that the nation states are the central actors of uh, global politics, right? And moving toward 21st and 22nd century, Many scholars argue that we, were, we are moving away from the modern. Okay? We are moving toward the postmodern era. Okay? You may call it information age or postmodern age, you know, or maybe we are not going to uh, the postmodern. We are still living in modern era. You know, it, it is, we are talking about future, so we don't exactly know what is going to happen in the future. But uh, in my opinion, as, as a scholar review, uh, there is a change, 
And we will see uh, the fundamental changes when we look back uh, 21st century when we, live, when we live in 23rd century. Okay. So anyways, we think of 17th century, what is the important year? What is, what is 1648? 1648, what happened in Europe? Treaty of Westphalia, right. Treaty of Westphalia, that, that is uh, the treaty among the states after the end of 30 years of war, which, is, which was a religious war. And the states decided that all the states respect other states' sovereignties, and they basically established nation-state system, which has been persistent, which is still existent. Okay, until now, okay. in postmodern era, if you agree with me that there is a change, then the important thing is the emergence of diversity. Not only nation states, one second, uh, non state actors becoming more important. Okay. So, uh, in this slide, um, all the decision-making or implementation of decisions were top-down, okay? State has an absolute authority, and global society has been run by the states, particularly the powerful, strong states. Okay? So if you think of what happened uh, in the Second World War, and after the Second World War, who established the United Nations and who established the WTO and IMF, okay, etc. Okay. And these are countries such as United States, Great Kingdom, United Kingdom, um, and France, Russia, and all those countries, right? Even South Korea never participated in making institutions or making global decisions, right? So th those powerful states made the rules and norms and institutions, and those rules and norms were imposed to other countries. That's, I mean, top down, okay? But in postmodern era, with the emergence of diverse sectors, okay, there's a more process of bottom-up, okay? Bottom-up, I mean, there's two ways of bottom-up. You know, there's a more important roles for uh, middle powers and smaller powers, okay? So if you uh, look at the changes from G7 to uh, G20, okay? Now G20 means 20 uh, countries are participating in discussing the international issues, right? So more countries are actually participating. And more importantly, Non-state actors are participating in decision making and implementation, and you know, uh, in making norms, and making rules, etc. Okay, so there are many cases. Uh, you know, I can show you uh, sometime. If you take my class, you can uh, talk. I mean, learn about it. Uh, a lot of cases that non-state actors, non non-government organizations private corporations, transnational corporations, those actors are, are, are making decisions and participating in global uh, system, okay? So uh, states no longer only and most powerful actors, okay? That's the fundamental change, okay? So there's a change, changing range of sovereignty, okay? We are supposed to respect sovereignty that is written in charters, Charter of the United Nations. We still respect sovereignty, but you know that sovereignty has been eroded. It's, it's, uh, uh, the autonomy of the state uh, is declining, in a sense, in many ways, uh, in, in performing their economic policies, and particularly in the field of environment and human rights. You know, the, the sovereignty of states has been, for example, uh, humanitarian intervention. Okay. Uh, you, you, you are not supposed to intervene in other countries' matters, domestic matters, 
Okay? That's the principle of non-intervention and respecting sovereignty. But in new norm, that is uh, humanitarian intervention and also the responsibility to protect. Okay? A country, another, I mean, other countries can intervene, the other countries, okay? in case of there is a severe human rights violations. Okay? That's the changing uh, sovereignty concept. Okay? So we say 20th century uh, is modern, we say modern, we, we say 21st century, pre postmodern. Then there was importance of nation states and of important value of sovereignty, and mostly decisions were top down, and power and wealth were most important concerns for states. Okay. When you uh, speak of national interest, what are the national interests? Not to have more power and to have more wealth we, it was the, uh, the national interest. But in 21st century, in changing environment, we call it postmodern, and the importance of global society increasing, and we often talk about the global citizenship. Okay. So I, I participated in so-called global citizenship education program. So I, I educate Korean students that you need to have identity, not only as a Korean, but also as a global citizen. Okay. Because it's the global society. Okay. And, but the map process has been uh, expanding. And not only power and wealth, network and information, it's a very important concept in terms of role of the state. Okay. So role of the state is traditionally to protect their, your, your people and become more wealthier. Okay? So more, more power to protect your people and become more wealthier to provide more uh, food and shelters to your people. But now, the role of states is to have a more network, have more information. Okay? Uh, it's very difficult to explain in a word, but information, for example, information is source of power now. Okay? You, you, the more you know, okay? uh, for example, in the past, when you have power, what, what, is, what is the contents of power is a military weapons, mostly, traditionally, right? If you have a military weapons, you have a power. Okay? So non-government organizations don't have power because they don't have military capabilities. Weapons, okay? But if you see 21st century now, a lot of NGOs have very powerful, okay? it's, for example, uh, the Amnesty International. You know, they are very powerful. What do you mean? What do you mean about powerful? You can you can change the behaviors of actors, okay? Otherwise, the actors would not behave. So you can change, you can influence the actors to do something. Okay? So Amnesty International make a report, then states will listen to that and they will have to change their policies. Okay? Why Amnesty International, for example, are so powerful, okay? it doesn't have wealth and power, because they have information and they have a network. Okay? So uh, 21st century state also need to have a network and information as a source of power and to be a better uh, state. Okay. Uh, so, in terms of development, 20th, 20th century, uh, they prioritized economic growth. Okay. Economic growth prioritized over human rights, environmental protection. Right? So, in advanced countries, European states, even South Korea, when we were developing, we were not concerned with human rights and environment. Okay. Actually, that was a failure that hurt uh, the global environment and it hurt uh, the human rights situations in many parts of the world. In 21st century now, they prioritize sustainable development. I believe most of you know the concept of sustainable development and also human rights-based approach to development. Okay. So 
uh, they are. Um, this is a lesson from failure of 20th century developed model. Okay? So they too much focus on economic growth. We have the side effects, okay, byproducts of the, in, the degradation of the environment, okay, and a lot of human rights violations. So we emphasize the right-based approach now. Okay, let's move on to the concept of global governance. I just compare the government with the governance. Okay. I would say it's more horizontal, I mean governance, it's a more horizontal where when the government is more hierarchical. Okay. There is uh, the hierarchical system, there is a power, a formal authority, okay. But in, term, in, in case of governance, um, they have a shared goals okay, rather than formal authority. Okay. And it's say more encompassing than government. Okay. Um, let's look at the, the, the next page. Wow, it's very complicated. I think I need to have some more Okay, I need to explain this. Okay, uh, 21st century, uh, we talk about global governance. Uh, there are three important points. Uh, diverse actors, right, as I said, you know, not, not only states, but also non-state non actors are participating. And secondly, more participation. Okay? The actors are participating. Okay? And for, thirdly, it's autonomy. Actors are autonomous. Okay. So they are, they are autonomously participating in global decision making. Okay. So as I said, NGOs, for example, okay, in 20th century, there, there was no room for them to uh, participate in decision making. But now, there's a lot of rooms that they can participate autonomously okay, as one of the uh, global actors. Then governance, Unlike government, it doesn't have any hierarchical system, but in global society, there are diverse actors making network, they are running. Okay? They do what the governments do in global society. Okay? Without formal government, we don't have a global government, but there is a system, okay? a horizontal system, the, the, where diverse actors are actually participating. So that's the concept of governance. And in that situation, I use often the concept of the meta-governance. So states here is not uh, the leader, but need to act as a mediator for governance system. Okay? Mediator meaning encompassing both top-down approach and bottom-up approach. Okay. So top-down governance is basically what we have in modern society. The states making decisions and apply those rules to the society. So authoritative power of government actors enforce action of other actors. Okay. While we have a still top-down governance, we need to emphasize the role of non-governmental actors in civil societies. Okay. And states need to mediate mediators for the, this system, okay? That's the role of the state, okay? So in terms of development, how much state need to intervene in the economy, okay? You know, um, in the free economists, um, economists say the state should not intervene in the economy, in the market, right? The free market is always better. Um, but if you can see, if you see the many uh, development process, for example, South Korea, the government intervention was prevailed. So it's, it's a lot of government interventions. So in a sense, government need to intervene, particularly in terms of making rules and norms, and making systems and institutions. Okay? But how much? What what should government do? Okay. So in 21st century, what government should do? is different from what government should do in 20th century. Okay. 
So uh, there's uh, two challenges for uh, the governments in developing countries in this world. The first is how much they, I mean, they have to face with the new changes. Okay. Frankly, it was much easier in 20th century to develop. It's much, diff much more difficult for underdeveloping countries in this world in 21st century okay, because they have to face the fundamental changes. They have to meet with the global norms, new changing norms. Okay. And, and the second point is whether or not uh, states, how much states need to intervene in the economy, in the market. Okay. And how much state need to concern with the human rights? Okay, I will discuss that uh, more. Okay, so uh, need for change. Um, whereas the states are still important, it's so a key to reforming institutions, but we need to embrace non-state actors. Okay, so cooperation is critical for global governance. Okay, uh, due to the time limits, uh, I will just skip most part of this, this part. Uh, um, I just explained this one. Three pillars of United Nations. You know United Nations. And the three pillars of United Nations are peace, development, and human rights. Okay. So uh, when the UN was established, at the end of the Second World War, okay, obviously they want security and peace, peace and security, because the, we had the Second World War. We don't want that war to occur again. Okay. How we can establish peace and security was a major concern. And secondly, the development was a very important concern. Okay. There's a new, uh, the independent countries emerging. And this is the, one of the missions, how uh, we can help they, uh, they develop. Okay? And human rights were thirdly the most important uh, pillars of human rights. Okay? So they have developed all kinds of uh, human rights protection mechanisms. Uh, since the lack of time, I'll skip this one. Uh, then I will want to, want to say this. OK, now, in 21st century, in the United Nations, they tend to more focus on human rights, even if the human rights was one of the major pillars at the end of the Second World War. Human rights were not, have not been considered as important as much as security and development, particularly since we had a Cold War right after uh, the UN establishment. Okay, human rights were disregarded by most states. Okay. But end of Cold War, end of Cold War in the 1990s, we have a lot of uh, the human rights violations in, in, in late uh, 20th century. Then becoming 21st century, uh, the people realized, I mean people in the United Nations realized that we need to more focus on the human rights. So so-called human rights mainstreaming is happening. Okay. So human rights becomes undercurrent of the whole uh, UN mechanisms. Okay. So I, I think I need two more slides. OK, here. OK. According to Kofi Annan, the former uh, General, Secretary General of the United Nations, we will not enjoy development without security. We will not enjoy security without development. And we will not enjoy either without respect for human rights. Okay? I think this is a very important statement, okay? very correct statement, also very important uh, in the mainstreaming human rights in UN system. So uh, let's move on to the human rights and development. OK. Relationship between development and human rights. I believe uh, many of you came from the developing countries. 
Uh, is there anyone who can express your opinion about the relationship between development and human rights? Is it negative or positive? In other words, do you think in order to develop, human rights need to be sacrificed? Hmm? No? Human rights need to be respected? Okay. There's a lot of human rights violations in the process of economic development. How can you explain that? So, no, I, I'm, I'm a human rights guy, and I agree with you, both of you, but I got a lot of questions from, even to, from my colleagues, that, no, human, you, you, you have to, you don't have to, I mean, you shouldn't think about human rights when we discuss economics, economic development. Okay. That's what even the professors here in GSIS are telling me, okay. And, um, the assumption of that statement is that if we had respected human rights in South Korea, South Korea would never have been successful in economic development. That's, that's the statement of them. I mean, most people believe so. Is anybody who can agree with that statement? You? you, you so can you t tell me about your views about this? I have the same opinion like you said right now because I as now I believe that development bring more um, beneficial society to human being so during that period um, sacrifice of human right is a um, needed thing so yeah thank you. Thank you very much. So, anyone who agree with her? Yes, please. I think we, when we speak about development, it's like micro-economic uh, perspective. And human rights, a little bit like macro is a perspective. So, if you want to speak about growth, maybe you have to sacrifice some rights to achieve some level of development. Then we can, you know, discuss human rights issues. Like, if you are starting from the bottom, I don't think that you can achieve uh, kind of human rights issues. So he, she a little bit agree with her. But at the same time, isn't it assuming that by sacrificing human rights, we will always achieve a certain amount of economic development? Because now South Korea has already achieved it. And we are saying it's right because we have sacrificed it. But what happens if you sacrifice and you fail to achieve development? Because I think it's more important to try and achieve a balance between both. So even though economic development might require a certain amount of sacrifice on the social welfare, but it's not um, something that we must do. Okay, thank you very much for your opinions. Um, yeah, we're right. Um, you, it is the fact that South Korea was successful in economic development. But it is not a fact that South Korea developed because of human rights violations, right? It is the fact that there was a violations, but we cannot say that because we violated human rights, South Korea have developed, okay? That's not the logical, right? Uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to say here. So there's a lot of debate about the relationship between development and human rights, okay? In mainstreaming of human rights people now, okay, say that these two are complementary. These should go to together. Okay? You cannot see development without respect for human rights. You cannot see human rights uh, promotion without the development. So it is interrelated. Okay? That's the view. But as, as we discussed, there are many people who say that to a certain level, Okay. Uh, to a certain level of economic development, we, we should not too much concerned with the human rights. Okay. That's the understanding, right? If not violating human rights. Because we promote, for example, too much democracy, too much participation, then we lose efficiency. Okay. Because uh, for economic growth, efficiency is necessary, but 
you know, if you democratize more people participating, then there is a chaos. Sometimes it comes in chaos. Okay? Now you see uh, the people demonstrating against the Korean government uh, for the many issues, uh, you know, textbook issues, etc. And I don't know if you see uh, the, the news and what happened in, uh, last Sunday. Even in South Korea, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, inefficient process of uh, you know, resolving the conflict. Okay? Uh, if you have a dictatorship, if you can stop those kind of demonstration, it's much easier, right? But uh, you know why we need democracy and why we need, uh, we need to protect and promote human rights? Okay? That's, that's where, how, how people are supposed to live. Okay? As a human being, you need to have a human rights. So anyway, um, in the discussion of, there's a lot of discussions, but if you look at this, can there be development without human rights? In 86, as early as 86, UN Declaration on Rights to Development, the human person is the central subject of development and should be the active participant and beneficiary of right to development. Okay? So human person, human beings are central subject of development. When you say development, okay, you're not talking about the numbers. Right? You're talking about the human beings, the welfare of human beings. Right? And UNDP 1990, human rights and development share a common vision and purpose to secure for every human freedom and well-being and dignity. So even uh, the scholars like, uh, uh, what is the Indian scholar who got the Nobel Peace Prize? Amartya Sen. Sen, right. Amartya Sen uh, argues that development is freedom. Okay. So uh, without freedom, okay, which is a basic element of human rights, okay, you, you cannot see development. Okay. So uh, from their view, no, there cannot be any development without respect for human rights. Okay. So this, this is Kopian and mentioned. So there is uh, the human rights development and security are all interlinked, mutually reinforcing. Okay. So if you see the human rights and development, so no development without human rights, and no human rights without development. Okay. And in, in this relationship, and all interrelated, interlinked, right? If you have a denial of human rights, it will lead to instability and violence and lack of peace. Okay? So all interlinked. So I have a case here, Indonesia. Is anyone who from Indonesia? Oh, do you know about this? Uh, no, palm oil is very important source of income for Indonesia. An Indonesian government launches MP3EI a plan, okay, and its national development plan based on processing natural resources, and government actively encourages massive land deals, okay, in order to promote uh, the palm oil uh, the plantation to secure land for oil palm plantation, but. Weak legal framework to protect the victims of problematic land deals. Okay. And there's a lot of right violations of land owning vulnerable groups. Okay. So when in the process of acquiring the, the adequate land for oil palm plantations, okay, there was a lot of human rights violations. So land conflicts increased by 86% during the first two years. In 2013 alone, 36 nine cases of conflict and 139,000 households evicted and 21st, I mean, 20, farmers died in conflict areas. Okay? So protesters were violently oppressed. Okay? So if you see, uh, this is one of the, the little cases um, you know, without considering human rights. 
Okay? Development plans can be very unsuccessful. Okay? Then how about, all oh, right, and okay, let's look at uh, the right-based approach, which is a very important concept. Definition of a right-based approach, HRBA, development activities that aim to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights as codified in international human rights legal framework. Entails citizen empowerment to demand for rights, state obligation to promote the citizens' rights, and strengthen the capacities of right holders to make claims and duty bearers to oblige. Okay. So, uh, in the development, human rights always need to be uh, considered okay. as a right holders and duty bearers. In the past, we can say it's a need-based approach. You know, we provide uh, the foods and uh, necessities those, to those who have need, okay? and try to keep away from politics. Okay? And they believe that economics need to be separated from politics, and ask power holders for help. Okay? But right-based approach, the rights as a universal and for all, so politics is at the very heart. You know, politics, uh, not in terms of negative sense, but in terms of the people's participation in the decision making, you know, politics need to be uh, you know, the center of our focus. Okay? You cannot keep away from politics. Okay? And officials are accountable. Officials are responsible for the protection of human rights and promotion of human rights. Okay. So that's the right-based approach. Okay. okay, lastly, move on to the case of South Korea. Um, sacrificing human rights to achieve development. You know, I always have a difficult time uh, when people in developing countries ask what they can learn from South Korean experience. Okay. I cannot say, them, say to them, you need to have a dictatorship. Okay. Dictatorship, authoritarian government, obviously, fund, I mean, basically violating human rights. Okay. Then South Korea actually had a dictatorship, you know, Park Jong hee uh, when I was very young, he was the president, and I hated him. I remember all my families, you know, didn't like him. Uh, so uh, when I uh, was 19 years old, he was assassinated, and I was so happy. You know, everybody was happy, there. and not everybody, but most people were happy when he was assassinated, and we thought that the democracy will come around. Uh, but democracy didn't come around right after he assassinated. Another dictator, she came around. But anyway, but now, many people respect him. He, was, he is the, one of the most respectful presidents in Korean history. How can you explain that? You know, he, he's, he's a brutal you know, human rights violator, but he's respected as an economic growth promoter. No, we can discuss it, uh, it's a very long time, but think about it. Anyway, what he said, he focused on economic growth. Okay? Only, he is only interested in economic growth. Okay. Economic growth to be achieved at all cost. War-torn, resourceless Republic of Korea, Park jong hee ruled from 1961 to 73. And GDP growth, we have almost 10% at that time. Okay. And one quote here, I don't care if 30,000 lives are lost while suppressing dissent protest, just get it done. Okay. That quote explains how brutal he was. It's a totalitarian dictatorship, 
infamous for human rights violations. Okay? But he was successful in an economic course. So not only scrutinizing you know, corruptions, etc. Okay? But I always say this, you know, this is not a human rights class, so you, you, maybe you don't know about the human rights in detail, but there are two kinds of, there are many kinds of human rights, but they are, they are very important too. Uh, uh, the human rights is civil and political rights and economic, social, cultural rights. Okay? We say it's the first generation rights and second generation rights. Okay? Um, so civil and political rights is like a right to vote, right to participate free expression, etc., most likely related to the democracy. Okay? And social, uh, economic social, social rights are the you know, right to education, right to health, you know, something we have to provide to people, okay? uh, right to social welfare, etc. Okay? In my opinion, if you, in human rights, we say that these two rights are indispensable indivisible, inseparable, okay? meaning that it cannot be separate. It should be promoted at the same time. Okay? So civil and political rights and economic social rights are inseparable, meaning that if you have better economic social rights, then that will lead to better civil and political rights. Okay? So in case of South Korea, I argue that, and look at this, this is very interesting, uh, the graph. South Korea officially became democracy in 1987. Okay? And if you look at the GDP per capita in South Korea, okay, the increase was mostly after South Korea was democratized. Okay. We, we think that these periods, we had a huge growth, okay. and after democracy, the growth is stagnant, but that's not true. You know, after this, we have this one because we have a financial crisis. I'm a finance crisis, 1997, but mostly in democracy, South Korean um, economic uh, you know, growth uh, was more uh, impressive. I think I'm missing a lot of uh, slides. I don't know why. But anyway, in South Korea, what I'm arguing is um, in terms of economic social rights, like education, the social welfare, we have a very well-established system. Okay? Even if we had a dictatorship, there is a violation of human rights in terms of civil and political rights. Okay? I think uh, the, the education system and welfare system and health system ha had a very important foundation for South Korea to become a democratized uh, the, in the 1980s. Okay? So uh, this is the lesson uh, that the developing countries can learn from South Korea. Okay? Um, you know, human rights, w when we think of human rights, we automatically think of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, right to vote, okay? mostly civil and political rights. But equally important is economic social rights. Okay? And most developing countries, both civil and political rights and economic social cultural rights are unprotected. So if it is difficult to have uh, the civil and political rights, if you look at these economic, social, cultural rights, you know, it, it is uh, inseparable. It is interrelated, reinforcing each other. So uh, this is a very important uh, lesson you can learn from South Korean case. And also, you know, it is an uh, illusion that in South Korea, because of dictatorship, South Korea was successful. Okay, that's, that's not true, in my opinion. Okay, so what does this all mean? Uh, 
no long-term development without human rights. Okay? Human rights protection and promotion is a key fundamental to economic growth, economic development. And democracy contributes to development and human rights. Uh, I think it's almost time is up, so I'll stop here and I'll get some questions. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so my question is about the case study of South Korea. So you mentioned that pre, uh, former President Park, actually um, his leadership and the totalitarian dictatorship somehow contributed on the rapid gro economic growth of South Korea. So um, with that, I believe that not only his dictatorship and totalitarian idealism was um, the factor of rapid growth of South Korea because uh, social culture values that South Korean valued like education, investment, and hard work that also greatly contributed on the economic growth. So yeah, I wanted to ask your opinion about that. Okay, uh, that's exactly what I'm, I was trying to say, actually. Maybe I didn't clearly uh, express uh, my opinion. Uh, what I said is, in general, many people argue that South Korean economic success can be explained by the present Park jong hees leadership. Okay? And his leadership is associated with the political dictatorship. Right. So it's, it's, it is general a link that Korean economic growth was related to the political dictatorship. That is also related to human rights violations. Okay? But that is not true. That's what I'm saying. Okay? That you cannot say that. Okay? Um, you know, and also I mentioned the importance of economic, social, cultural rights. And I also mentioned the right to education, education, health system, welfare system. Those were well established in South Korea. Uh, and that's a very important foundation for Korean economic success and also political democratization later on. So I agree with you. Uh, what I'm trying to say in the graph is actually Korean uh, the GDP growth, was, um, the more the more gr gr grow after uh, the democratized. Okay. So that's also a myth that under Park jong hee South Korea rapidly uh, grew. Then after Park jong hee South Korea declined. I mean, some people believe this, I, mean, I mean, understand that way, so that's not right. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Even after democracy, South Korean economic growth was more, more, no, fast okay, than before. Of the developed countries that exist now, so the OECD countries, I know um, that most of them had some sort of human rights violations during development. Are there any notable exceptions to that case where human rights weren't uh, violated to achieve development? You mean developing countries? Developed countries. Developed countries. Yeah. Were there any that didn't violate human rights in order to achieve their success? Uh, well, it depends on, you know, for example, the Gr France, Great Britain, United States, when they were developing, you know, they had the slaves, right? Slaves were not considered as a human rights violation, right? They have a slave system. But from, if you look at the the perspective of contemporary world, then that's a severe violation, right? So it, it is very difficult to judge you know, from this perspective now. But uh, if you uh, look at the European states, like uh, the England and France, you know, they had a uh, the certain degree of civil society okay, when they were developing, when they were industrializing. Okay? Uh, there are a certain level of democracy Okay, developing also. So uh, I cannot say that there was no human rights violations in the process, but relatively they were concerned with uh, human rights okay, in relation to the other part of the world. Yes. yes. You mentioned that um, uh, South Korea didn't really, um, 
it's a myth that South Korea developed during uh, b due to the dictatorship of uh, former President Park Chung Hee. Um, what would you? What would you? How would you explain the case of Singapore? Because um, the the leadership of Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, they actually say that due to like they had to repress human rights, and that was um, the the government is actually saying that their that their repression of some human rights contributed to the discipline and therefore the economic development of country of the country. So how would you actually explain it in the human rights and development framework? Would you say it's similar to the South Koreans, even though that the government admits that they had to suppress human rights um, in terms of uh, sacrifice like for their development? Are you from Singapore? <laughs> but I'm, I, it was just like, um, it crossed my mind when you were talking about it. I thought about that, so uh, it kind of like formulated my head. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm from the Philippines, so. Okay, the Singapore was a very unique case. And uh, we, in the 80s, we used to call four dragons. Do you know the four dragons? South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan, right? because four countries were rapidly developing, and a lot of scholars in the West was trying to explain why the, those four dragons were successful. And major argument at the time was a strong authoritarian regime, okay? because the four countries had, had a more, all the authoritarian. So uh, the, the theory at the time was that in order to develop economically, grow, you know, at the least you need to have an authoritarian strong state. Okay. But by 1990s, end of 1990s, when those countries had uh, the problem, particularly South Korea had economic financial crisis in 1997, and the scholars now at the time was blaming the, the authoritarian regime. Okay. Because of authoritarian regime, they had uh, this crisis. But anyway, uh, in my opinion, Singapore is very hard for Singapore to be compared with uh, the South Korea. I mean, Singapore is a very small city state, okay, city country, and South Korea has a huge population. So for Singapore case, um, no, obviously it's authoritarian. It's, is, is there, there is a still human rights violations in Singapore. You know, uh, there's a lack of participation of people, there's suppression, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, the criticisms from global civil society, but Singapore is still economically you know, strong and they have their own system. But uh, if it has the size of a South Korean population, you know, so, so, they, that would never happen. Okay? So in case of South Korea, you know, among the four dragons, South Korea is the only country has, which has a huge population, it's enough population to, for the civil society to grow. So uh, you know, I would be very careful uh, to take a Singapore case uh, to uh, teach I mean, other developing countries to give uh, to give lessons uh, from Singapore. So Singapore is not a good example, actually. <laughs> yes. Um, hi, I'm I'm from Singapore, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm from China as well. So uh, from it's, both it's, countries. Let's, let's start. <laughs> yeah, like, like the both countries have experience and lived in. Um, they all use the same rhetoric that. Uh, the legitimacy of the government lies in its ability to provide economic welfare for the citizens uh, and at the sacrifice of social welfare. So, uh, like, currently a lot of the government thinks that uh, the, legit the legitimacy of government lies in the democratic characteristic, which is true vote. And there's also this rhetoric about how by providing economic welfare, it justifies dictatorship or authoritarian characteristic. Do you believe that by uh, a government's ability to provide economic development actually justify its, its harsh uh, control on social welfare? It's like, um, so basically this idea that, you know, uh, if a government can provide economic development by sacrificing um, uh, human rights, 
does it justify uh, the government's action? Can cannot be justified. How how can it be justified? I mean, uh, uh, you know, in South Korea, in Singapore, you know, many other many countries, um, there are authoritarian regimes, right? And again, you know, many people say that because of authoritarian regimes, economic success was possible, right? That that's the the state's strong state theory, okay, which was very popular in the 80s. Basically, I do, I do not agree with that. Okay, the success was not coming from the authoritarian dictatorship, not I mean coming from other factors. Okay, so uh, uh, human rights violations, particularly in 21st century, the new environment, it cannot be accepted. Okay, human rights violations for the purpose of economic growth that that cannot happen. Okay, so. That's, that's my, 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 my position. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Professor, for your presentation. Actually, I'm curious to know about human rights-based approach. This is a very new concept for me, new terms. So in this regard, I would like to know, is there any like, indicators or standard to measure or monitor human rights-based approach as a global in the UN level? That's it, my question, thanks. Okay, uh, human rights-based approach. Here's a question about the RBA. Um, if you want to know a detail about human rights-based approach, you have to take my class <laughs> because I cannot explain all. But this concept is new, okay? it's developing. Okay? But fundamental idea is, as I said, in the all kinds of process of development, all, all stage of development, okay? human rights need to be mainstream. In, 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 in the stage of planning, in the stage of the implementation, in the stage of monitoring, you know, and also even the companies, private companies, they need to be concerned with the human rights. They have a responsibility for the human rights. Okay? So we. Now we say uh, corporate social res responsibility, right? CSR, and also we now say so corporate human rights responsibility. There's a new developing concept. Not only social responsibility, but now they are uh, developing human rights responsibility. So uh, that's the sort of a guideline okay, uh, provided by global civil society and United Nations and they keep talking about a dialogue uh, to develop this concept. Okay? So um, if, you, uh, if you're interested, you can type the human rights uh, yeah, responsibility or uh, based approach uh, in the website. There's a lot of information there. One last question. Uh, thank you for your excellent lecture. I deeply enjoy learning a lot about from your lecture this time. Okay, so I just want to ask your personal perception about the global governance and the feasibility of cosmopolitanism. So with the help of the globalization and technological advancement, so every single person, regardless of religion, have at least two identity, like the national identity and transnational identity as global citizens. So my question is that there is any possibility of conflict between two? And I mean, like these two identity can be consistent together because according to the real list, the Serbian state major objective is to foster and maximize like their national interest. Thank you. Okay, very uh, fundamental question of international relations theory. Uh, I'll teach all the politics next semester. So if you didn't take yet, you can take my class. But, um, Question is very good question. Okay, uh, you know I talk about moving from modern to postmodern era. Um, the realists would not never agree with me, right? Uh, they they believe that the nation-state system will persist, uh, and uh, the states are still most important actors. Um, I, in part, I do agree. Uh, with uh, the argument that states will survive. Now, I'm not saying that states will disappear. Um, you know, states, but 
as I said, the you know, role of the states will change, actually changing okay, what states are doing. Okay. In the past, you know, nobody concerned, nobody can intervene, even if they had a huge human rights violations, the killings, this even whatever happens in domestic society, international society are not supposed to talk about it. Okay? Every state has a sovereignty. And actually, in the beginning, every king has sovereignty. Right? So king is not supposed to be intervened. Okay? That's the concept, concept of his. But over the years, you know, there is an intervention, right? And intervention is allowed, even if we respect human, I mean, sovereignty, right? And it seems that human rights, global human rights, is more important than national sovereignty. That's the global society now. Okay, that's the trend. Okay, that shows you know, how the cosmopolitan uh, the global world is. So I, I would say there's a two worlds coexisting. Okay, one state system and one cosmopolitan system. Okay, there's a two world, actually you are facing. So you need, you need to have a, if you're Korean, you need to have a, the Korean identity, but at the same time, you have identity as a global citizen, right? So that's, that's why you are concerned with people in France when they had attack, right? Because of the communication, you know, mass communication, news, you know, internet, SNS, you, you are knowing, I mean, in the past, there's no way you know what's happening outside of your country, right? But because of technology, because of the mass media and you know, all the new uh, information age, you know, we uh, immediately know that we feel sorry for them. So that shows how global this society is. So there's two worlds coexisting, and I think uh, that's the concept of global governance. Okay? We accept the states are existing, but we do not expect world government will emerge in the near future then we need to certain system to uh, manage the global problems. Right? Now, the global governance structure is dominated by the great powers, but not anymore. It cannot be anymore, right? So more, I mean, solutions that they provided have a certain limit. Now it's time for global civil society to make voices and they make, participate in making global norms, particularly in the field of environment and human rights, etc. So uh, we don't clearly know what kind of desirable system will emerge in the future, but we need to aware that the system is changing and we need to be ready okay, for uh, the emerging future. Okay? okay, so thank you very much. I hope to see you next semester. Okay.